Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much. I hope you can still stay awake, having had lunch and, um, uh, yeah, tea after me. Um, I'm not a Philippine expert. I'm the uh, Deputy Keeper of Anthropology at the Horniman Museum, uh, where I'm responsible for the Asian collections and the European collections. So you can see that I'm coming to this. Um, this is a, a very small part of the collection I'm responsible for, and I'm exploring it really for the first time. The Horniman Museum has recently opened a new uh, world gallery. It opened it last week, in fact. There have been many press reviews, mostly good, well, all good, of course, um, but I have found some of them illuminating. Uh, despite their delight in noticing how the gallery shows change and includes modern material, it highlights human connections as well as celebrating difference, some journalists have struggled with stereotypical notions about museums. Uh, Catherine Hughes on Radio 4 remarked how museums had stolen their material. Uh, the presenter, I was pleased to hear, pointed out this was hardly likely in the case of the Horniman collections. Um, another highlighted the opportunity to see weird things, um, a word which was subsequently removed from the online version of her piece. Most commentators, I'm pleased to say, recognise that the intent in the Horniman Museum uh, at any rate, is to help visitors recognise their common humanity and to think about how objects can carry all sorts of meanings, especially in relation to memory, love, power and expressions of belonging. We all relate to objects. But the objects have come into the museum over a long period of time and their interpretation too is subject to change. So this paper looks at the Philippine material to suggest the context in which the museum has acquired material, often with no clear understanding of what the objects meant in their source community and what they might mean in a display. The title of this presentation reflects the fact that collections are rarely made with a de deliberate intention to represent, although they seem to be expected to. They come about because of historical circumstances, popular as well as scholarly ideas, practical constraints. Um, we've sadly had to part with our Philippine rice barn because uh, it was so big. And sometimes connections between people. These factors, of course, also change over time, except in museums based on one permanent static collection. I don't know of any such museum, but perhaps there is one. And this is not the case with the Horniman Museum, whose anthropology collections have increased from about 3,000 items when they were first listed in 1898 to around 80,000 today. The museum was founded in 1890, rebuilt in 1900, and presented by the founder, Frederick John Horniman, to the London County Council as a free gift to the people of London forever. And that's inscribed on the wall, so um, we, we don't pay for people to come in, um, in 1901. So in the more than 120 years since it began, around 200 items from the Philippines have gathered on its shelves, both in the galleries and in the stores. And I want to consider how this came about and what, if anything, it tells us about how the Philippines and her peoples have been viewed. The Horniman Museum, or Hornimans as it's known locally, was originally formed of collections made by Frederick John Horniman, who was the son of a tea merchant, himself the son of an umbrella maker. Um, Frederick became a liberal MP, so he was um, uh, generally anti-establishment, I would say, uh, and a philanthropist. The late 19th century was the heyday of empire and naturally some of Horniman's ideas must have been influenced by the colonial context, if only for him to uh, contest those ideas. Uh, but his museum was not a state institution, it started more as a private passion. He was an amateur collector of art, by which he meant anything man-made, the word seems to have changed its meaning, and nature, which is everything not made by uh, man, i.e. he collected everything. 
His collections were first displayed in his own private house, and you see a scene here, and included a lot of British material, as well as items from mainland Europe and other parts of the world. In what became known as Surrey House Museum, rooms had such titles as the Elizabethan Bedroom, the Ethnographical Saloon, and the Indian God's Room. There were 22 rooms. Um, the image shows him in 1891, second from left, in the Ethnographical Saloon, with his wife and son and the curators. The display rooms could be visited first by friends and acquaintances, and later by members of the public on specified days in the week, before it opened completely um, when it was in the new building. Items which Frederick collect, collected reflect his own taste and interests, and as well as being outside a state structure, they were also acquired outside an academic framework. Some were donated to the museum by friends and acquaintances, some were brought to the UK by missionaries. Horniman was brought up as a Quaker, and there were many overseas connections. Many other items were bought from dealers, and some came from auctions after the international trade exhibitions, which followed the 1851 Great Exhibition, which had inspired Frederick as a young man. The first register made of items in Frederick's Museum was made in 1898, and it lists several boats of models from the Sulu archipelago, the first mention of items from the area of the Philippines. These would have been displayed with boat models from other parts of the world, where boat technologies could be compared. Uh, so they weren't representing the Philippines, they were representing ways of making a boat. Um, it's likely that they came from the Indian and Colonial Exhibition of 1886, in which such material appeared. Horniman had acquired the bulk of his collection not to promote particular ideas about the world, but for his own satisfaction to impress his friends and colleagues and to amaze and intrigue the people of South London with examples of skillfully made artefacts as well as curiosities from the rich and varied peoples of the world. But from early in the 1890s, Frederick began thinking of building a new museum. Surrey House Museum, where the collection was originally displayed, was a domestic property which had been adapted to become a museum and it was not ideal. In 1896, Frederick commissioned the architect Charles Harrison Townsend to design a new museum in the fashionable Art Nouveau style. The structure was very modern, of iron and concrete, the lighting electric, and the building centrally heated. It was the epitome of progress. In 1898, Surrey House Museum was closed and the existing building demolished. In, eight, in 1901, Horniman gave his collection and the new purpose-built museum in which it was housed and the 20 acres of gardens to the London County Council as representing the people of London, dedicated to the public forever as a free museum for their recreation, instruction and enjoyment. So as well as a place of pleasure, it was very much um, uh, for education. The first curator, Richard Quick, uh, listed the objects and arranged the first displays. Objects were grouped not by ethnic group, but largely by material, type or technique. One case displayed lacquerware, another showed pipes, some had wood carving, and so on. Material from all over the world might be together in one case. The boat models, for example, would have been in the water transport case. When the museum was passed to the London County Council, an advisory curator, Alfred Court Haddon, was appointed. As an academic anthropologist, he immediately redefined the museum as ethnographic and replaced the curator, Richard Quick, um, yes, there was a bit of a storm about that, uh, with Herbert Spencer Harrison, a protégé. Haddon's influence dominated the next 30 years. The galleries were rearranged to show the evolution of art, that is the evolution of technology, from Stone Age to industrial. This was not an evolution of peoples or cultures, however. It was not social Darwinism. The perspective was on a universal development of technology. There was no focus on individual countries, cultures or ethnic groups. 
The case to the left of the attendant um, in the image is entitled Evolution of Decorative Art. There were some cases which looked at other aspects of life. At the front is a case on Buddhism, which the handbook explained as being a very complex subject on which the museum library held many books where people could read further. It was too complex to explain in the handbook. Um, most of the man-made objects were in the South Hall. The North Hall was devoted to natural history. The first handbook, which came out in 1904, shows how objects were arranged. And I deliberately picked this out because of <laughs> the racist language. Um, it's actually quite rare to find any. <laughs> but there it is. Uh, so we're not hiding it. But um, despite this language, the text is focused not on people, but on material. Uh, for example, um, Stone Age methods um, still employed in Britain were um, noted and also advanced technologies in simple societies. There is sadly no mention, I am going to get on to some soon, but there's no mention of material from the Philippines at this point. Here we go. The handbook for 1910, however, included one photograph showing a comparative image of various methods of making fire around the world. At the top is a fire saw from the Philippines, which in fact is not mentioned in the museum's register, so they weren't very efficient <laughs> at documentation. But we have found it on, on the shelves, and I can see somebody in the audience knows how it works, so I'm looking forward to finding out. <laughs> the first item listed in the accessions register as coming from the Philippines, apart from the model boats, which were almost certainly made elsewhere, um, is this basket acquired in 1909 from the dealer William Ockelford Oldman. This would have been placed immediately on display in the cases illustrating the stages in the evolution of the domestic arts, which included displays of basketry, pottery, spinning and weaving, ranging from very simple structures to more complex ones. Again, these displays would have juxtaposed material from all over the world. The following year, 1910, Alfred Haddon himself donated a pipe from the Philippines together with three specimens illustrating the Sia Padu or lost wax process. This donation was illustrative of the museum's focus on techniques and materials. He's interested in how it's made. Um, the pipe was classified as Igorot. Is it, did you say Igoroti? I don't know how they said it. In fact, they probably didn't know themselves. Um, two years after this donation, the museum purchased an Igorot axe, though this has not yet been identified on the shelves. This was followed by the purchase of two carrying baskets from a Mrs. Turnbull. It's interesting how you get one object and then, uh, you know, people sort of beginning to become aware of the Philippines and that uh, we haven't got anything from there. So um, they purchased uh, these, that's one basket back and front. Um, and there's the second basket. Um, the baskets may have been displayed in the section on land transport um, as objects were partly classified by function and these would have been used for carrying heavy loads. Um, and Mrs. Turnbull also donated a textile, a beautiful blanket, if that's the right word, um, unfortunately, we have no idea who Mrs. Turnbull was, um, <laughs> um, but she, she, yeah, they were nice things, I think. Anyway, um, and also this is a terrible photograph, but we rely on our documentation photographers. This is a rice container, sort of overhead shot. After Mrs. Turnbull's donation in 1914, no more material from the Philippines was added to the collection for nearly 40 years. Um, this is probably because of the way museum collections grow. Most items come, from, obviously, from countries where you have a connection, and um, uh, most items came from parts of the then empire, either through colonial officers, actually, yeah, that should come last, not often colonial officers, missionaries or traders or, uh, you know, um, travellers. Items from parts of Europe were also acquired because Europe's closer geographically and culturally than most other parts of the world. And there were very few direct connections between the UK and the Philippines. Despite the curator's best efforts, for example, Haddon 
bought a collection of 130 items from the Arctic when he was in the USA in 1909. So he's always looking for things that are underrepresented. Uh, but many parts of the world were practically unrepresented at that time. Anyway, in 1950, the first Philippine material to be acquired since 1914 came in when the widow of the dealer William Ockelford Oldman, interesting, we'd only ever bought one object from him, um, but um, his widow donated items left unsold from his collections. Um, and I want to emphasise that many museums at that time, and some still today, certainly the Horniman, can consist largely of donated material. The contents are therefore determined at least in part by the donor as much as by curators. Donors believe that what they're donating fits with the museum's collections um, and at certain times there may be a tendency on the part of a curator to accept rather than refuse for various reasons. Um, sometimes there's one thing that you want amongst the group and you know it's difficult to say to somebody well thank you very much but it's rubbish you know. You have to find another way of putting it. Anyway, um, but in the case of the Oldman collection, um, the, the objects clearly looked interesting. Um, many of the Oldman pieces came from other parts of the world. They came from all sorts of places. Um, William Oldman was born in 1879 and died in 1949. And he collected ethnographic art, so-called, and European arms and uh, armour, and he, he was also a dealer. He was mostly active in terms of business between the late 1890s and 1913, and I suspect that's when this material dates from. Um, not knowing the date or background does reduce the value, I don't mean monetary, but the value of material in a collection, in terms of what it can tell us. But it can be valuable nonetheless, and the curator has to make a, a judgment about that. Oldman purchased collections from various sources, including items that were considered surplus from many small British museums. We now have regulations and museums are not really allowed to dispose of things anymore well, without going through massive processes. Um, so that source has partly dried up. He produced um, auction catalogues illustrated with photographs, which are very, very useful, between 1901 and 1913. And he also offered items direct, di directly to clients. Uh, after 1913, he stopped holding auctions, uh, but he still had his clients. His own personal collection focused on Oceania, although he never travelled to the Pacific, and so Anything that wasn't from Oceania, um, he would offer for sale. Um, the headcloth on the right is part of a complete costume, or so we're told. So I would like to be told. Uh, it includes trousers, which I haven't got a photograph of, uh, and this jacket. Um, the interpretation of this material is particularly difficult without help from descendants from the source community. Um, and the museum has collections from all over the world, so it's working through uh, it, the material, inviting contributions. Um, so I'm, I hope this is the beginning of an engagement with um, the Philippines. Mrs. Oldman's donation also included five shields, including these three. Um, and I put the, the words that came with these objects, um, you know, we just note them down and... Uh, they're up for challenge. There are other items including a backstrap loom. Not everything's been photographed yet. By this time, material did not go on display immediately. Some space was devoted to a store for objects taken off display or waiting for space. And there were several redisplays over the ensuing years. In 1953, the museum accepted a donation of a bow, quiver and arrows, as yet unphotographed, from a Mr. K. Puckle. So if anybody knows who he was, we'd be pleased to hear. And here's his letter. The, the several letters, they don't tell us much more than this one. But it was interesting. We don't often hear where things came from. So um, the native bow and arrows set from the pygmy aborigines. Uh, 
uh, as described to you in my original letter. They inhabited in 1923, when I came by them, the region around the American army camp of Stotzenberg. Does that mean anything? No. Oh, well, interesting. Anyway, uh, this is a fairly typical sort of do what donors say. I'm very glad to have found a home for them. They're usually cluttering up the garage or something uh, where they're appreciated and where they may do some educational good. Well, not so far, but um, let's hope so. Uh, and, um, yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, it looks as if the curator... Um, didn't get any further details. Now, the largest single acquisition of Philippine material came from Kenneth Athol Webster in 1954. Um, and I suspect it, he got it from somebody who was collecting it with an ethnographer's eye, um, because partly because there are little notes here and there. Webster was chiefly a collector of material relating to New Zealand. He was born in New Zealand. In, when he was 30, he worked his passage to England, where he was called up and joined the army, um, and uh, he became captain uh, in the Second World War. After the war, he became a collector-dealer. Um, there are ledgers for his 2D art um, collection, unfortunately not so much about material culture. Um, he got some material through exchanges, and Leicester Museum sold him ethnographic material salvaged after bomb damage. Mm -hmm. Philippine material would not have interested him for his own collections, so I'll just show you some examples of what the Hornman purchased. Um, these are two women's girdles. Um, are they belts? I mean, oh, I thought they must be. It, it, when it says girdle, you're never quite sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we don't know how to display them because we don't know how they're worn. Um, and, um, yeah, it's only really when collections are looked at in, in relation to where they come from that you can start understanding them uh, properly. Um, this textile uh, was listed as a woman's skirt, and the word kiangan was written with it. And I, is that a place? Yes. yes. All right, okay. Um, sometimes it's a place, sometimes it's an ethnic group. Usually the documentation officer doesn't know which it is and it often gets put in the wrong place. Um, so this, uh, this one said in Tulu, but I suspect that might be Bin Tulu. In Tulu? Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Good. I shall put it in the right place then when I get back. Um, then we have these boys' girdles. Um, this piece was clearly woven on a continuous warp. Um, so I don't quite understand how that would be worn. So if anybody can... Oh, it's just that it's never been used. Okay, so we've got several of these. How long is it? Well, there's a... No, yeah. Um, so there are three more of those. So uh, the top three are in addition, and the one underneath is described as a boy's waist sash. Uh, then we have a, a jacket and loincloth, and an accompanying note says a loincloth worn whilst working made of natural cotton, grown and spun in Ifugao. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, this has not been unrolled recently, so the photograph is, shows uh, what was described as a burial shroud. I'm always a bit suspicious of burial shrouds because uh, people tend to say that when they're trying to sell things because they think it sounds more interesting, um, but it... It may be, uh, but we have yet to explore that. Um, we don't know what the, f the fiber has not been listed by the staff. And then a woman's belt made of rows of shell and dark brown horn beads with wooden slats in between. Don't know where that's from. Um, there's a wooden bowl top left, uh, brass if you go ear ornaments, silver ear ornaments, and boar's tusk armlet if you go food box on the right. 
So this is all from this same collection, and it really looks to me as if somebody is being quite <coughs> systematic and trying to kind of get one of everything, or maybe three of everything, uh, if they, <laughs> I don't know, um, of, from where they are, wherever it is. Um, the terrible photograph, again, wooden box hol hollowed out from one block of wood on the left, and a wooden lime container with a stopper in the shape of a bird. Right. Uh, okay, so that's the end of <laughs> that little... Uh, there are some more, but that, those are the things that have been photographed. Then in 1956, a collection was purchased from a Captain R.P. Jo Jones or Johns of Lower Belgrave Street. It included a Jap some Japanese masks, an African musical instrument, a Buddhist stone stupa, a Bronze Age Iberian pot, and two items from the Philippines, which makes me think that he, wasn't, he didn't have a connection with the Philippines. Um, so either he inherited these things, or he was a mad collector, or we don't know. Um, but uh, it's a quite a nice sword and sheath, um, and a breastplate with apparently horn panels. Um, so I have to find an expert in armour. Anyway, we have discovered so far that he was in the Somerset Light Infantry in 1925, which is, but they never went to the Philippines, so that's no good. Um, yeah. Quite often, what's happened is they've got a big collection, they've sold all the best bits, or what are considered to be the best bits, to other museums who've got a budget, and then we get what I think are the interesting bits that other people <laughs> don't want because they're not pretty enough. You know, it's, we, do, we tend to not have... We have got some elite material from the early days, but nowadays we're more interested in... Uh, well, I don't know, in the 1950s, I think they were just trying to fill up the building. <laughs> Literally, actually, yeah, anyway. Um, the, no, interesting uh, acquisition in uh, 1978, actually. I don't know why it says 1973 there. Um, they were transferred um, to the Horniment by Hereford County Museum. Uh, and we have the name of the person who originally got them. Souvenirs, I mean, it actually proudly says, the one on the left, that it is a souvenir. Um, their interesting category, they speak both of how visitors see or are expected to see a country and its people and of encounters between two cultures. They're usually collected because people feel, you know, they want to remember. Um, so it's um, the opposite of stealing things, I think. Um, and sometimes a great many items in a museum collection have been made specifically for foreigners and people just don't know that. Some museums would see this as problematic, but at the Horniman it's a very interesting anthropological avenue to explore, although you don't want 100% souvenirs, uh, but it's an interesting aspect. And uh, as with the um, Hereford County Museum, the Bourne Hall Museum uh, was getting rid of... Actually, it was when it was founded, it inherited some material from another museum, <coughs> which had closed, and um, this material was not deemed to fit its remit. Um, we didn't accept everything from them, and in fact, they lay around on the shelves for a long, many years before uh, a decision was made. Um, but we have two loincloths, um, a bit of piña, a tiny bit of piña is better than no piña at all. <laughs> And yeah, okay. Um, and and this little figure. Um, then we got a collection from uh, a guy who'd been collecting in Southeast Asia, so lots of Indonesian material. And these two pieces, he decided to emigrate, and one suspects he might have been being pursued by Scotland Yard because he he just ran and didn't leave any forwarding address. Um, but he did leave some quite nice things. Um, this small collection came from a member of the UK diplomatic mission in the Philippines. She had been posted to Oman and Japan and Indonesia, and she gave us things from there as well. Um, but she bought some, uh, yeah. Also, she gave the museum a drawn threadwork tablecloth set, um, which in many ways is very Philippine, <laughs> that kind of needlework. The occasional single item donations, this came from uh, a man who gave us a lot of things from Southeast Asia, only one from the Philippines, but it's very nice. Well, I think so. Um, 
Then we have a collection from Colin Bickler, who was a journalist, um, and he served <coughs> with Reuters news, news Agency for 26 years all over the place. And oddly enough, the only things we got um, were from the Philippines. Um, maybe he didn't collect anything anywhere else, but um, again, these were passed to us by his family after his death. Um, it includes 13 hats. He was... You know, you know a collector when they start collecting examples of the same type of thing from lots of different places. So uh, the 13 hats here are some. And then these three beautiful baskets, um, two of which are currently on display. Um, and then in 2016, um, a collection which was made intentionally. Uh, we had a program with the Royal Anthropological Institute to fund some young early career researchers to bring some things back from their fieldwork. And Dahlia Iskandar had actually gone out to research healing practices uh, because, you know, there's a lot we can learn from them. And uh, she, did, she made some film um, of a ceremony and the items used by the healer were co collected with the healer's kind of consent and knowledge and I think enthusiasm for the museum. Um, and this kind of field collection is actually regularly undertaken by Horniman curators, the staff, uh, but in their own areas of expertise. So uh, we haven't... Anyway, this project gave us the chance to broaden the scope a bit. Um, so this is probably the first time the material from the Philippines has actually been looked at as a group. Um, the idea has now been mooted several times of mounting a display focusing on textiles from the Philippines. And if this is done, it will need funding, collaborative work, photography to show the human dimension, um, because we always like to include people as well as objects in our exhibition. I don't mean real people. I mean, I, mean, I do mean real people, but images, um, film or photography, showing how things are made, those sorts of things, that these are not just things that you get in a shop, because otherwise museums look like shop windows. Uh, and probably we want to acquire some new material to show that it's come from a living, changing, continuing culture. And if the project goes ahead, it will offer a range of opportunities for collaborative community interpretation. Thank you.